One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. I've been in large and small churches uh, with and without elders and do a lot of consulting at times with smaller churches and have a real empathy for them. First of all, you're not alone. 80% of all churches of any kind in the United States have less than 200 members, so that, that's not unusual. Uh, in consulting, we'll tell you that 200 is about the max that you can actually lead a church with the natural gifts and experiences you get having your own family, you know, as per qualifications from Timothy and Titus. If it's a church larger than two or 300, you will have to have other skills to lead that church. It's the difference in a mom and pop operation in Walmart kind of thing. Um, and what you're going to find, uh, that there are four things every church needs, no matter what size it is. It has to have a spiritual base or foundation, uh, you know, commitment to the word, uh, gospel of grace that continues to live out, the, the desire for God to work through his, their lives. I mean, a lot of things have been discussed here. A clear mission an answer to why is this church in this community that is connected to God's vision, an organization within that church to fulfill that, no matter what size it is, and you've got to have the relationships that First John defines. If we're walking in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. All four of those things are necessary. What you will find in reality is churches less than 200 do a little bit better at the spirituality and relationship and fail at mission and organization. And churches that are over 500 do pretty well at mission and organization and fail at spirituality and relationships. That's why larger churches spend a lot of time and energy and money creating what a small church has naturally. They call it small group ministries and fellowship groups. Most of us can, we max out at 50 people anyway in terms of just close friends, relationships, you know, whatever. But we're living in a world where all the attention goes to megachurches. And I think the day of the megachurch may have peaked. I mean, I, I, you know, there's a generation coming along that are more like their great-grandparents, probably more, sim they want more simple life, simple faith, simple church. Um, so I think, first of all, we've got to get over this sense that numbers is our source of confidence, that our confidence is in the Lord, not how many people that are there. Because uh, I was the only team in Jerusalem for four years. I understand uh, a fellow missionary kid here. Um, but there was a lot of things that happened. I mean, when I moved out here and we worked in Montebello, uh, my, my daughters were the only two kids in that church. But they were so richly blessed by inter you know, the intergenerational relationship. It was rich. We went back to Memphis. They got involved in the youth ministry and almost lost their faith. You know, I mean, it was they, they, they went immature around immature all the time. It it doesn't always bless them, but when you're around spiritually mature people, that intergenerational relationship is wonderful. Okay, let me, let me talk about the small church, uh, because there is a lot of hope for these small churches. And the same thing, uh, what I'm going to say next, applies to all size churches. The harsh reality is a church never rises above its leaders. I mean, it's seldom. You may find a rare one, but basically churches don't rise above their leaders. So we've got to continue to nurture leadership in churches, large and small, wherever it is. Because it's the leaders that will help connect vision to, to, the, to its mission and help define that and execute it and organize around it. Um, it's leaders that will continue to nurture faith and do the shepherding. I mean, when I my, you know, first thought at this question was, well, what, what would Paul say to that question when he's writing this small new church in Colossae. So what's the hope for the church in Colossae? And he can write chapter 1 verse 27. Christ is in you, the hope of the dokes of God, the glory or the honor of God. And I would say the same for any small church, wherever it might be. If we continue to be faithful to God's calling and that leaders emerge that can do God's will and service there. Um, Hebrews 13 and, and, and you know, we, we struggle today. Uh, I, I think sometimes big churches, whatever, may kind of become our temples. 
it's our you know our, our faith is in numbers our hope is in numbers but in small churches your faith isn't dependent on how how masterful a singing is or that it's the best show in town on Sunday and, and I say this often, I mean, do you think jo Joshua would have made it through all that wandering in the wilderness without a praise team and an exciting service on Sunday morning? I mean, he made it. He, it didn't take a Sunday morning worship service to keep Joshua faithful or Abraham or any of those that we know. So what's wrong with our faith? Even in small churches, it doesn't have always the most encouraging moment every Sunday morning. If our faith is attached to that, he would quit. I would assume, you know, most missionaries would, that it, it, it's, it's going to cause us to restructure. And what does it? Okay, quick, uh, quick final and I'll pass on. Ministry consumes energy. In a smaller church with less resources, you get out of energy fast. And yet the mission is so big. All of Marseille or all of the Canada or wherever it is. I mean, it, it's huge. The one thing that generates energy is not preserving ourselves and backing off it's stepping up vision generates energy and mission consumes it so what you do every sunday in that small church you continue to remind that church of god's vision and you excite them and you'll find vision connecting to mission in a very short amount of time they will find needs to start responding to it and out of that comes the stories that say you mean a little church like this can do this and pretty soon, you've got a church that's blooming and coming alive right there and becomes an oasis wherever it may be. And it's because of the Spirit of God that works within it. And you, you never let the mission kill the vision. That, that's in, uh, 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 above my desk right there. <laughs> Probably uh, um, the, the biggest challenge for us is, is teaching. It has to do with education. Because the education is uh, a control by the state, and the state for 150 years ha has had an out, you know, uh, out there, very um, um, clear statement that they want to teach people and, and teach them away from God, you know, and, and teach them that God does not exist. You you have to go to a class that's called philosophy, and that's what they teach you for a couple of years. So it's it's really an outspoken uh, atheism. And uh, we believe that that's why the churches are dying out, because the kids buy into that. And if we can't keep our kids, if we can't show them who Jesus really is, then we're, it, it will be a losing battle. So it, it is very much a generational uh, um, uh, work, type of work, type of commitment. And that's why France is a hard place to go as a missionary, but it's a very exciting place. Uh, you know, you work and... You pray that maybe your grandchildren will see the fruits, and that's okay. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see your exalted. We are the body of Christ.